Hi, I'm Dr Catherine Hughes from Crime Psych. Today I'm going to be looking at Britain's most dangerous serial killer, Robert Maudsley. Many thanks to my friend Stephen Ledgem for suggesting this case. Every now and again I come across a case where I can actually empathise with the offender. Aileen Warnos was one. She suffered so much abuse at the hands of the men in her life. David Pomfret and Sally Challen are also under this category. Their spouses subjected them to years of abuse before they went on to murder them. This case comes under this category too. Once you start to look at an offender's background, you can easily begin to understand why they did what they did. If you do want to learn more about offender profiling and criminal psychology, I do have several online courses available for all abilities. All of the details for that are on my website and you can find that in the video description. If you do want to support me on Patreon, I would very much appreciate it. You get access to exclusive information and subscription starts from just the price of a cup of coffee. As I have said in previous videos that I've done, being subjected to abuse isn't a reason to murder someone. It can help us to understand why they did it though. However, there are thousands of people who've also been abused, beaten, neglected and they never go on to commit a crime themselves. Robert Maudsley was born in June in 1953 and he was one of four children who lived in Liverpool. Robert, his brothers Paul and Kevin and his sister Brenda were all taken into care when they were found to be suffering from parental neglect. The children were placed into Nazareth House, which is a Catholic orphanage in Crosby, and that's run by nuns. The four children were very close to each other. Their parents would occasionally visit them, but as the youngest, Robert didn't really know them. They lived, the children lived at the orphanage for nine years. Then their parents, George and Jean, gave birth to a fifth child. They took the children then from the orphanage to live with them in Toxteth and that was the start of a horrific campaign of physical abuse towards them. They went on to have seven more children, having 12 in total. His brother Paul told reporters at the time, at the orphanage, we'd all got on really well. Our parents would come and visit but they were just strangers. The nuns were our family and we all used to stick together. Then our parents took us home and we were subjected to physical abuse. It was something we'd never experienced before. They just picked on us one by one, gave us a beating and sent us off to our room. Robert Maudsley has said, all that I remember of my childhood is the beatings. Once I was locked in a room for six months and my father only opened the door and came in to beat me four to six times a day. He used to hit me with his fists, with sticks or rods, and once he busted 22 caliber air rifle over my back. Robert's brother, Paul, has said the abuse came on gradually. It was a very strange situation to go from Nazareth House to sitting on the couch in a house with parents who didn't talk to us. He went on to say, Bob as in Robert Maudsley, didn't get abused more often than me and Kevin. All three of us got our fair share. Brenda wasn't beaten. But he went on to say that Robert was the youngest and he thinks that it affected him more. He said, I remember in Crosby, Bob turned around and said that he didn't want to go back with our parents. That was in mine and Kevin's mind, he went on to say, but Bob was the only one who said it. He then adds, it's just the old fella who hits us with his fists, belt and sometimes a stick. But our ma instigated half of it. If we went to the shops and came home late or didn't come straight home, she would bring it to dad's attention and then he would beat us. Within 12 months of moving in with their parents, Robert and Robert alone was placed with several foster homes. His brother Paul has since said that he couldn't understand why they'd picked on him to be fostered out and not the other children. Robert then drifted down to London at the age of 16 and developed a massive drug habit and he spent the next few years in and out of psychiatric hospitals after repeated suicide attempts. On numerous occasions he told doctors that he could hear voices in his head telling him to kill his parents. He became a rent boy uh, and that was just simply to fund his drug habit. 
Maudsley committed his first murder in 1973 after being picked up by a labourer called John Farrell for sex. When Farrell produced pictures of several children that he'd abused, Maudsley flew into a rage and garroted him. I completely understand how that happened. He was brought up for nine years with close bonds to his, to his brothers and his sister in the orphanage. They'd all thought of the nuns as being their family and it sounded as though they were fairly well taken care, care of in the orphanage. They were then taken back to their parents who were more or less complete strangers to Robert. Robert said he didn't even want to go to live with them. He was abused in some horrific ways. He was beaten, as I said, with fists, belts, stick and a rifle. He was locked in a room for six months and his father would just come in and beat him several times a day. It is entirely possible that we don't actually know the full extent of the abuse that he suffered. Maudsley has later said that he was raped as a child. He almost certainly will have felt trapped and alone when he was locked in that room. He was taken away from safety and put in harm's way. It's likely that he felt a great deal of anger and resentment. Robert moved as far away as he could on the first opportunity that he got. Because of his anger and resentment, he used drugs as a way of coping, as a coping mechanism. He was hurting and the drugs allowed him to metaphorically stick a plaster over the wounds rather than processing and dealing with his feelings. This is a fairly common thing with drug addicts and with alcoholics. They run and they hide from their feelings and they use different substances to cope with life. Becoming a rent boy would have been a very easy way for him to make money. He could have been feeling as though he hated himself and it didn't matter what he did to his body as long as he was able to get money to fund his drug habit. I don't know if you've ever had one of those red mist moments yourselves or you've seen it done, but something triggers you and you lash out before you even think about it. But when John Farrell paid for sexual intercourse with Robert, he showed him the photographs of the children that he'd abused and that was the red mist moment for Robert Maudsley. All of the unresolved anger and resentment was unleashed on Farrell that day. It was an immediate reaction that wouldn't have been thought about. It wouldn't have processed through his mind by Maudsley. After he killed him, he might have felt some regret. He might not have done. This man was representative of Maudsley's parents for him. In fact, he even said that if he'd killed his parents in the 70s, none of these other people would have died. During his last merge trial in 1979, the court heard that during his violent rages, Maudsley believed his victims were his parents. The murders, his lawyers argued, were the result of this pent-up aggression, resulting from a whole childhood of near-constant abuse. Robert Maudsley had said, When I kill, I think I have my parents in mind, he said. If I had killed my parents in 1970, none of these other people would have died. If I'd killed them, then I'd be walking around as a free man without a care in the world. Following the murder of Farrell in 1974, Maudsley surrendered himself to the police, saying that he needed psychiatric care. Maudsley was found unfit to stand trial and was instead sent to Broadmoor Hospital. However, in 1977, Maudsley and another patient locked themselves in a cell with a third patient called David Francis. They barricaded the cell and tortured Francis for nine hours before killing him. Maudsley had split a plastic spoon in half to make a sharpened edge and he stabbed the ear of the victim. At the time, the media was running daft headlines such as Francis's body was found with his head cracked open like a boiled egg and a spoon hanging out of it. And that earned him the title of Hannibal the Cannibal. In reality, Maudsley didn't eat any part of the brains. He'd made a makeshift weapon by splitting this plastic spoon in half to create a rough pointed weapon. He then punctured it into his ear, penetrating his brain. And astonishingly, Despite killing a patient in Broadmoor, Maudsley was found fit to stand trial for that one. He was convicted of manslaughter and sent to Wakefield Prison. Within weeks of arriving there, Maudsley killed two more people. 
The first was Salney Darwood. At the time of his death, Darwood was serving life for the manslaughter and severe domestic abuse and violence towards his wife. Maudsley lured him into his cell, cut his throat and then hid his body under the bed. Maudsley then spent the rest of the morning trying to find other people to lure back to his cell, but no one would go with him. Eventually, he sneaked into the cell of Bill Roberts and attacked him as he lay there on his bunk, stabbing him with a makeshift knife and then repeatedly bashing his head against the wall. At the time of his death, Roberts was serving seven years for the sexual assault of a seven-year-old child. After he'd killed him, he very calmly walked into the wing office, placed a serrated homemade knife on the desk and informed the guards that they'd be too short when it came to roam call for the next day. All four murders had targets who were abusive and or child abusers. You can't excuse that, but it is clearly a motivating reasoning and factor for him to commit those crimes. Maudsley is officially classified as Britain's most dangerous prisoner and a man he's said to be a man who represents such a high risk to those around him that he spent the past quarter of a century in virtual solitary confinement with no prospect of ever being released he'll remain in prison in isolation until the day that he dies. Maudsley is housed in a glass cage and that's a two cell unit at Wakefield Prison and it bears some resemblance to the one that was featured in Silence of the Lambs. It was built for Maudsley in, in 83 and that was seven years before that film was released. It has large bulletproof windows through which the inmate can be observed. The only furnishings are a table and a chair and they're both made of compressed cardboard. The lavatory and the sink are both bolted to the floor, whilst the bed is a concrete slab with a thin mattress on it. A steel door opens into a small cage within the cell, encased in thick perspex, with a very small slot at the bottom through which the guards would pass in food and other items. He remains in that cell for 23 hours a day. During his daily hour of exercise, he's escorted onto the yard by six prison officers. He isn't allowed contact with any of the other inmates. This is quite remarkable, really. I've covered so many different types of cases and they have horrific cases of abuse and murder. But no other prisoner that I've came across has been subjected to the same level of imprisonment as Robert Maudsley. Beverly Alec killed babies and children and she still mixes with others. Robert Fitzgerald murdered Richard Huckle in prison, but he's allowed to mix with other prisoners. None of these other people are confined to solitary. Even Myra Hindley and Rose West aren't subjected to the types of conditions that Maudsley is. Now, everything that I've told you about the case so far paints a picture of a deranged killer with no empathy, someone who's able to take the life of another and feel absolutely no remorse. He's a dangerous man who's been kept in solitary confinement for the safety of the other prisoners. However, those that knew him describe him very differently. Robert Maudsley has a genius level IQ. He loves classical music and poetry and art. He's keen to take an open university degree in music theory. Friends and family describe him as being gentle, kind and highly intelligent. They enjoy both his company and his sense of humour. And it leaves me wondering, why not just put him in a cell or in a prison where he can't have access to child rapists, abusers and murderers? I think the best way I can sum up this case is to say this. This wasn't a grown man acting out aggressively without reason. He's a frightened little boy in a man's body. He went from a safe place to where he was feeling happy and he was made to live with people that he didn't know and who would lock him up, hit him, abuse him and rape him. From the age of 9 to 16, he was trapped in a living nightmare. He moved away as soon as he was able to and he used drugs to try and escape his memories and escape his feelings. When he came across a man who was showing him pictures of children that he'd abused, Maudsley reacted and he lashed out, killing the man. Once he was in prison, he had close contact with more people who'd been abusers and he unleashed his anger on them too. 
He was locked up in prison in the exact same way that he'd been locked up as a child. He was living out the trauma day in and day out and still is. If you never treat the cause of the anger or the resentment that a person is feeling in the first place, they'll never be able to overcome that and to interact with normal people and have a normal life again. As far as I could find out, he's never killed an innocent man. I don't or I didn't find anything out about him attacking any guards. So that level of solitary confinement in a glass cell, is it really necessary? I know that he needs to be punished and so does he know he needs to be punished. He knows that he'll never be released from prison. But Maudsley and his supporters have campaigned for years for just some basic human rights. The only furnishings that he has are a table and a chair made of compressed cardboard. The lavatory and the sink are bolted to the floor. The bed is just a concrete slab with a very thin mattress over the top of it. In 2000, Robert Maudsley made an application to be allowed to take a cyanide pill rather than face the rest of his life in solitary confinement. His application to die was made at Liverpool High Court and after a five-day hearing, it was dismissed. After the hearing, he wrote a letter to a newspaper which read, What purpose is served by keeping me locked up 23 hours a day? Why bother to feed me and why give me one hour's exercise a day? Who am I actually a risk to? As a consequence of my current treatment and confinement, I felt that all I have to look forward to is indeed a psychological breakdown, mental illness and probable suicide. Why can't I have a budgie instead of flies, cockroaches and spiders, which I currently have? I promise to love it and not eat it. Why can't I have a television in my cell to see the world and to learn? Why can't I have any music tapes and listen to beautiful classical music? If the prison service says no, then I'll ask for a simple cyanide capsule, which I will willingly take, and the problem of Robert John Maudsley can easily be resolved. Maudsley had begun at one point to make some progress in dealing with his anger issues. However, the treatment was stopped very suddenly and no reason was given for it. Does he have no human rights at all because of something that he did 25 years ago? If he doesn't have those human rights, then why not let him die as he's asked for? Why spend thousands of pounds keeping him in isolation, in solitary confinement? It makes no sense whatsoever. I do hope that you found today's video interesting. More importantly, I hope that you learned something new from it. Thank you so much for watching then. Bye for now.